Jeremiah. It's hard to speak the truth nowadays, isn't it? So hard that some of us even stopped. We don't share the truth like we used to. We rarely do now and because we're intimidated or we're fearful that they're going to reject us or it just doesn't seem to work anymore. Maybe I'm not the guy to share the truth. And so we, we learn to live as normal as possible without offending people. And in fact, they don't even know we're Christians because we, we, we've just gotten tired of, of sharing that truth. And it is hard. It is difficult. I'm not saying that it, it, it isn't. It's always difficult to share truth with somebody. A lawyer said to his client, let me give you my honest opinion. And the client says, no, no, no. I paid for professional advice. <laughs> he didn't want to hear the truth. He, he, he wanted to, to get professional advice on the situation. And, and that's the day and age that we're living in, right? Where, where it's okay to lie, you know, if it gets the job done. It's okay for a corporation to lie. It's okay for the management to lie. I was just speaking, we were just speaking about that today, a, a company like a, a phone company to lie just to get you to buy a certain plan, and then down the road you find out they lied to you, you know, I mean, it, it's okay to do all that, it, it's just so, so rare to find someone sharing the truth completely, and that's where we find Jeremiah today, uh, he's in the temple of God, he, he's outside of it so that he's drawing a crowd, and God has given him a message, and he's basically going to be one of these preachers on a box and he's going to share that message to the crowd and the crowd uh, will not like it uh, very much the religious men of that time the the scribes or the the priests and so forth will uh, will have this hatred towards Jeremiah and they will literally want to take him and and kill him uh, for what he is saying at that time and Jeremiah will use uh, obviously God as a witness that he has given him the words to share and so why are they persecuting him if God has told him to to share the things uh, it's natural to them to persecute and he gives some examples of others that were persecuted in the past uh, because of uh, the word that they had spoken and even though those words might not have been from God but these people are just really hard of of hearing but also of applying and James is very clear that we are to be not just hearers of the word but what doers of the word that means that we have to apply it to our lives it's nice and we think that because we're in church and we're listening uh, to the word and and we're agreeing with it we think that's applying it and it's not we need to go home and and ask ourselves, am I applying this scripture? A am I sharing the truth with people? Do I take those opportunities, even though it may cost me something? And so we see Jeremiah here um, sharing with the people, being being faithful as an ambassador of Jesus Christ in a sense like uh, Corinthians tells us that we're ambassadors for Christ. You know, uh, reconciling people unto God. We're pleading that they would come to the Lord. I used to be involved in a ministry called Pleaders for Christ. And we would go out every Friday night and, and, and share with people like Roman was, was, was sharing. I love those nights. Th those were probably the best nights that I've ever had. And, and I had stopped because I started a church, became a pastor, and it got really involved. Every once in a while when Roman was at the other church, he'd call me up and say, Hey, Dad, we're going to uh, those logos over there, and we're, gonna, we're just going to street witness over there. And so I'll, I'd go with him just to go. And, and it was just fun to do that. Even though he went to another church and it was for their church, I didn't care. I just wanted to get out there and share the word. And I miss that. There, there's, there's not a lot of places here. We can go to Circle K here and maybe meet a couple of people, you know, but it, it, it's really hard around this area. We don't have a mall. We don't have a great theater. I guess we could go to Eastvale, but then we're crossing the border, you know, and that's a little difficult uh, for us to do. So, so the church growth is not necessarily on evangelizing, though we do that. And this fossil goes out like on Saturday. And he shares uh, the word with the community, the neighbors. He goes house to house like Jehovah Witnesses or Mormons. But here we are, the truth going out, and yet, you know, it's not received as easily as maybe some of those others. So we're depending on the church, the body of Christ, which we should be sharing our faith. We should be light. We are light and salt. And so we're the ones, uh, as we sit here, when we go out there to invite our 
family and our neighbors and those that we encounter and at the restaurants or, or the car next door and we leave a track on the on the windshield you know we're the ones that, that spread the word would be committed and faithful to do that and then let God do the increase if that's what God wants to do but I love those nights and so Jeremiah is is, is brought to a trial here in verse 1. It says, In the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Joaz, king of Judah, this word came from the Lord, saying, Thus says the Lord, Stand in the court of the Lord's house and speak to all the cities of Judah which come to worship in the Lord's house. So, so you get this, this picture that God is talking to Jeremiah and saying, Look, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go to my house, the temple of God. I want you to stand out there. And as people are coming to do what? He says to worship the Lord. And yet God has a message for them, but they're coming to worship the Lord. What's, what's wrong with that picture? There's something wrong with that picture, isn't there? They're coming to worship the Lord, but yet Lord, the Lord has something to tell them. They're not doing something right, yet they're coming to worship the Lord. They're coming to church, but there's something that's wrong in their life. There's something that's wrong in their relationship. You know, just like 1 John is very clear, you know, we have salvation and fellowship with God, as John shared, you know, the thing that he touched and he handled, he, 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 that is the thing that he shares with us, that we know him, that is Jesus Christ, and what he's done for us on the cross. And then he goes on and talks about the fellowship. And if we say we have fellowship with him and yet we do these things, we lie, we break that fellowship. And a lot of Christians are at that point. Yeah, you have salvation and you know him, you've touched him like John, but you've broken the fellowship. There's a, there's a broken relationship because of sin in our lives and we don't have that fellowship with him. And if we say we do and yet we're walking or we're hating our brothers and we're not forgiving, God says you're lying and you've break, broken that fellowship with one another. And so you can walk into church, <laughs> you can walk to the temple to worship God and raise your hands, but there's something going on in your heart that you need to deal with. And Paul said that in Corinthians that we need to be open to say, am I walking in the faith? That's a big question to ask ourselves. We should probably ask ourselves that either every night or every morning. Lord, help me to walk in the faith this day. And at the evening say, Lord, did I walk in the faith? And if I didn't, I need to confess that. And that's why John said, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all your unrighteousness and you restore the fellowship again with God. That's not talking about salvation. That's talking about our relationship with God and one another. That's what that's talking about. That scripture should not be used to, to draw the unbeliever in. That's for us, that when we sin, we should confess our sins so that he can forgive us and it restores that fellowship with him immediately, just like that, as many times as we need to in every day. And, and so... They're, worship, they're coming to worship the Lord. They're, they're at the front door of the temple. Some translators uh, say the area in front of the temple or in the open area at the front of the compound of, of the temple itself. And he says, All the words that I command you to speak to them do not diminish a word. That's the command to Jeremiah. I'm going to command you to speak these words i don't want you to diminish any one of them don't leave out the a don't leave out the an i want you to share the whole truth and nothing but the truth so help you god <laughs> you know in a sense that's the command to jeremiah there's that's that's the command to him and yet we have people today cutting up the word of god we have preachers taking the word of god and 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 they're interpreting it in the manner in which is not biblical. We see preachers leaving out the sin, leaving out the repercussions. God wants you to have a, a, a wealthy life, a healthy life, a good life. He wants you to be happy. So don't be judgmental. Don't talk about sin. Don't talk about our problems. Just focus on what God is going to do in your life. And you take your best, best foot forward. I think it was Joel Olstein's wife who said that God wants us, wants us happy first more than anything else. And that's so untrue. It's unbiblical. And it's pointed towards self. And so we have preachers out there cutting up the word of God. 
once in a while when we would go to Calvary Chapel conferences, like men's conferences and big conferences, we would get groups of people go out there protesting the Calvary Chapel conference. And they would have their, their signs. And, and they would talk about apostasy. They would call the Calvary Chapel apostasy because they're, they're preaching a, a grace that, that has no consequences in a sense, a cheap grace. And it, it's not cheap, <laughs> To, 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 to say that the death of Christ on the cross is cheap is, is ridiculous. And, and so they, they believe that they need to preach the law. You, know, you need the law in your life. You need to repent. You're going to hell. You're going to burn and, and so forth. And that's true. That is so true. It, it, it's right on within its context. But we need to realize that the Bible is clear that it is the kindness of God or the goodness of God, the love of God that causes men to repentance. It's not the condemnation of God. And so you have to take it and, and, and combine it together. Yeah, we're sinners. We missed the mark. But, but here's the good news. Christ died on the cross and he took your sins. See, he's a just God, right? God is just. Somebody has to pay for sin somebody has to pay for it when you sin somebody has to pay for that you break a law somebody has to pay for breaking that law now usually it's you if you you, if you're speeding then you have to pay the speeding ticket and you go to court and you broke it and since the judge is just and he's following the law then it's a just just judgment that you broke the law so you pay the fine well spiritually speaking somebody has to pay the debt for your sins for my sins so God is a just God. So who's going to pay the debt? You? You can't pay it, can you? No. So who paid it? Jesus Christ. He went to the cross. And God laid our sins on him. And the debt was paid right at that moment. And so when he forgives us, he's a just God in forgiving because the debt's already been paid. Isn't that amazing? That is amazing grace. It's not cheap grace. That God would forgive you your past, your present, And your future sins. He already knows you're going to sin tomorrow. And he's already made provisions for that. You're forgiven. And you need to confess those sins tomorrow when they happen. And God will forgive you at that moment to restore that fellowship that you have with him. But as far as the east is from the west, he remembers them no more. And Tostalus die when Christ was on the cross. It is finished. It is done. It is complete past to present sins. That is amazing grace. And yet people cut up the word of God. And they want to just talk about that grace. But grace for what? To get wealthy. To be prosperous. To have a good life. But it's not grace from you being a sinner. And God having to be just. Having a punishment for that sin. And we see that today. We need to be careful not to cut up the word of God. The whole purpose for my meeting on Tuesday was. How do we implement the Greek and the Hebrew into the text as we're sharing. And it's pretty amazing how different, well, I'm not going to say that completely true, because it's not a huge difference, but there is some differences when you're interpreting the scripture and you're looking at the Greek itself. And I think we saw that when we went through Peter, and I brought out a lot of the Greek words to, to help clarify what the what the scriptures were saying within the within the context and so forth. And so, what I'm trying to do, here I am, 20 years in the ministry, and yet I'm going to a class on how to apply Greek and Hebrew so I can be a better teacher, because that's my heart. I don't want to cut up the word. I want to share the whole thing. As God told Jeremiah to share the whole thing, don't diminish it, don't leave out one word. And, and as I share, who do I share with? The ones that want the whole thing. They don't want part of it. They don't want just the good part. They also want the bad part in a sense because they know that's where growth is. Uh, they know that's where the, the love and relationship with Christ is when we please Him. The call of the pastor is to share the full counsel of God, right? From Genesis to Revelation, not just the New Testament, but also the Old Testament. I had a pastor that probably for 15 years, he never taught out of the book of Revelation. He just didn't want to touch it. He thought it was too much. But we need to share the whole counsel of God, everything that's written in the Word of God. And When does a pastor diminish diminish God's Word? When, When does he diminish it? He never should diminish it. That shouldn't be the 
the agenda to leave out certain things. <clears throat> One of the problems as a pastor and as you're teaching the word or you're preaching the word or you're an evangelist is that you want to get the word out. You want them to understand what's going on in its context. And, and so you have to you have to be as gentle, gentle as you can, sticking with the context, yet you have to share the truth with them and what is being said. This is what Chuck said, and, and I heard this in, when we were studying through Ezekiel, and I thought it was pretty amazing that he had the same problem as I had, and I'm sure that a lot of other pastors had. I, I remember at a meeting, uh, some other pastors saying the same thing, is that people will come up to you and they'll accuse you of taking the word and, and using it to discipline the church because the church is going through something and so then as you're teaching you start dealing with that subject that the church is going through. And then people take it personally and they say, well, you're just preaching from the pulpit what's going on in the church. And that's not right. You shouldn't be doing that. And Chuck agrees with that, and I agree with that too, that, that here we are talking about Jeremiah, he's supposed to preach the word, and then all of a sudden I start talking about, you aren't, you're not tithing, you know, because the church is, 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 you know, not where it should be, and so I start talking about tithing because that's a subject within the church that's going on, and people are involved in it, and so I start telling you about tithing, blah, blah, blah. well, that has nothing to do with the context, why am I bringing it up? Because now I'm bringing it up to, to really discipline you, to really correct you, because I've got an issue. And you can't do that. And, and Chuck says that, that you should never do that out of context. Deal with issues that are going on in the church. He says what, what's so neat about going through the word of God is eventually you'll deal with that issue. And when, you deal, when that context deals with that issue, that's when you bring it up. That's when you bring it up. Because God has brought it up. Through your teaching on Sunday or Wednesday or whatever day you happen to be in that chapter and that's what you happen to be preaching on. I know that not everybody is, is living up to the expectations that God has for them. And so they may be a little worldly. And we know what worldly is, fleshly. We know what that means. We're, we're not living a godly life. And we're neglecting God you know, completely. Sorry, I'm getting a phone call. And so then I go through Jeremiah, and Jeremiah's all about what? idolatry living like the world and the culture and so you start teaching on that and people that are living like that it's natural for them to be offended right because they're now saying oh he's talking to me see now he's pointing out my sins that's not right well wait a minute it's in the context though so either you're here to receive from god's word or you're not god is speaking all the time from the pulpit and he's speaking the word of God, and it shouldn't be diminished whatsoever at all. See, what, what, what has happened is our society, our culture, has diminished the authority of the church. It used to be a time when this country of ours was founded on Christian values, where pastors were the presidents of the United States. They were the governors. They were in the Congress. And you look back, a lot of them were pastors. H uh, Huckabee was a pastor, and he's in, in politics. That's the way it should have been. And throughout the years, slowly, we've diminished the authority of the pastors. Remember there was a time where Billy Graham was always at some sort of prayer, some sort of opening for the president of the United States. He has been doing this for years and years. And here comes this president. And what happened? He no longer is, in, is involved. They removed him. They removed him completely. Why is that? Because he stands for righteousness, for truth. And, and the world is taking that away from the church. And so now that they have done that, now they're attacking the church. You can't say that in church anymore. So if you're preaching on homosexuality out of, in context, now if I start preaching out of homosexuality in this context, which is, has nothing to do with homosexuality, then yeah, maybe I've got a problem with homosexuals. But if I'm in Romans chapter 1 and we're going through the context and I start preaching on it, no, I'm just sharing with you what the Word of God says. I'm not, a, I'm not trying to offend you, but if you're involved in that, well, that's happening. God's speaking to you to stop it. But the world doesn't see that. They now are saying, you can't do that. That is hate speech. 
and, and you're coming down on a group of people that have a right to live that way, and we're not going to allow you to do that. And so now they're policing the church, where the church used to be in authority, leading our country. Now it's being kicked in the back. And that's sad, because then the church itself begins to see that and they diminish the authority of the leadership within the church. And I think we need to take that back. I think we need to respect uh, the authority that God has set up. I think we need to respect the position. You might not like the man so much, but at least the position and the place. And we need to lift it up and encourage those that are in those positions to continue to preach the word and don't diminish any of it whatsoever. Why are our churches in our communities growing? You can go down the street and there's a few churches in our community that are they're growing, uh, they're expanding, but when you go and sit in these churches, they're not preaching the Word of God. They are watering it down so that they minister to the flesh of the people. That was one thing that I was taught by Pastor Chuck is that if you begin to minister to the flesh of people, then you've got to maintain that within the church. And as soon as you start preaching the truth, that's when people start leaving. But if you're not preaching truth and you're just catering to them, entertainment, you know, with, with worship, you hire groups, the best groups to really focus and get people moving and it gets all emotional, that's all flesh. But you get it to where it's the Spirit of God moving and it is genuine, then God is moving within that ministry. But as soon as you take a, a great group and you bring someone up with just as good of a heart, and then the people are like, well, that's not as good. Well, wait a minute. What does that have to do with it? It's the attitude of our heart as we're worshiping God, not how great they sound. That has nothing to do with it. They're leading us so that we're praying and, and worshiping God and focusing our hearts on Him. That's what that's all about. And we diminish the, the worship itself. But that's why the churches are growing. Because they give out turkeys on Thanksgiving Day. And Easter, they have... Easter egg hunts and bicycles and all of these things, you know, to cater to the flesh you know, or raffles and all that type of stuff. They remove judging, they remove sin, they remove those things that God is most concerned about. Don't diminish the word. Perhaps everyone will listen or pay attention in the Hebrews is what it's saying. Um, God is saying perhaps everyone will listen or pay attention and turn from his evil way that I may relent concerning the calamity which I purpose to bring on them because of the evil of their doing. So you see the heart of God there. God says he, he wished that none would perish but that all would come to repentance. God doesn't want anyone to perish. That's his heart. It's not true that God sends people to hell. He doesn't send people to hell. They reject him and send themselves to hell. We're our worst enemies. God's heart is that people would receive him and go to heaven. They would repent from their sins and be welcomed into heaven with open arms. And so here he's saying, Jeremiah, hopefully they'll pay attention and they'll repent. They'll come back and I'll just relent. I'll turn from, from what I'm going to do and everything will begin to be great again. They'll just start serving, we'll worship, and, and I will begin to build the nation and, and, and so forth, and, and we'll accomplish what my plan was the whole time. That would be the ideal thing to do. But they wouldn't do it. And you shall say to them, Jeremiah, thus says the Lord, if you will not listen, the Hebrew word actually would say obey to me, to walk in my laws or instructions which I have set before you, what will happen? To heed the word of my servant, the prophets, whom I sent to you, both rising up early and sending them, but you have not heeded, then I will make this house or the temple like Shiloh, and will make this city a curse to all the nations of the earth. So if they don't listen, if they don't obey what you have instructed them, Jeremiah, 
then I will take this house and I will make it desolate, is what he was saying. Notice that he said, take heed to my servant. Now he's not saying to obey what my servant has to say, but what he's saying is obey my servant as he's preaching the word, as he's giving the whole full counsel of God out, and he's not diminishing it. And so we're the catalyst of taking God's word and sharing it with the people. And then the people are to take that word and agree, because it's biblical, it's within its context, and it's what we should be doing, and then they should do it, obey it. As James says, doing the word and not just hearing it, but actually doing something with it, heeding it, obeying it completely. <clears throat> There's a scripture in Hebrews chapter 13. And it's a warning to pastors. It's also a warning to the church. Ephesians is very clear that he has set up within the church an order of government. God is the head, or Jesus is the head. God is the head of Jesus. And, and under Christ himself is the husband, the wife, and the children. Within the church, it's the pastor, uh, the elders, the, the deacons, and then the servants. And he set up this government aspect of the church itself. And if he set that up, then it's set up to be obeyed, right? To be accepted that this is God's form of government for the church. And so these men are leading us, and we need to pray for them. We need to encourage them. We need to lift them up to not diminish the Word of God. Even if I don't like it, don't diminish it. I love a man who will preach the Word of God and be, uh, be very clear on it, even if it offends me. Listen to what Hebrews thirteen seventeen says. Obey those who rule, rule over you, and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls. So, so the warning here for pastors is they watch out for the souls of the body of Christ, the church that they are overseeing. That's my responsibility. And God is going to hold me accountable to that. If I don't do my job, and, and I say job in, in, in the sense that my calling my responsibility, then when I stand before God, he, He's going to say, I, I gave you the position to oversee that church, to direct the people, to protect them. You're a shepherd, and people ripped off other people, and people came in and did this and that, and you didn't do anything about it. You'll be held accountable for that. So the warning is is that as pastors, as as Assistant pastors, we have a responsibility to oversee the church, to be good stewards of what God has entrusted us to. Now, on the other hand, and here's where the struggle is, is because we live in America, and we have gotten so used to the media, movies, television. Um, we, we are a society that thinks of itself first, and not others, like the scriptures tells us, think more highly of others than we think of ourselves. And so we live in a society where church has become like the culture. We're a fast food. Quickly, only give us 30 minutes and we're gone. We're out of here. You know, forget the fellowship, forget the involvement. We just want to get in and we want to get out. That's not what God wants. He wants us involved within the church itself. And so it's very difficult for a pastor to oversee that because there's those that are not submitted to authority, those that don't want to be submitted to authority or under the authority within the church. And so it's easier for them because they can just come and go as they please. And if they don't like it there, then they go somewhere else. And they just keep hopping from place to place, and that's fine. Because that's America. We do that. We've lost the commitment in... the strength to stick it out and learn how to get along, learn how to work together, learn how to apply some of the biblical principles that God has given to us like forgiveness and grace and mercy that 
goes along within a church itself, right? Those are all the things that work together. It's easier to just run away than to deal with issues. And I don't have to deal with it. I can just go somewhere else. But when you deal with it, that's where growth comes in because God's working in the body of Christ. So, the pastor is going to give an account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief. And he, there he's speaking to the body of Christ that um, your responsibility is is to encourage them so that they can at least find some joy in it uh, and not be in grief over it. For it would be unprofitable for who? For the pastor? Actually, it says for the people because they're not being obedient and they're making it more difficult than they than it should be. A great responsibility on Jeremiah's heart. He has to be faithful. Don't diminish it at all. And so what happens? Look at verse 7. As the priests and prophets, they want to put Jeremiah to death. So the priests and the prophets and all the people heard Jeremiah speaking these words in the house of the Lord. And it happened when Jeremiah had made an end of speaking all that the Lord had commanded him to speak to all the people that the priests and the prophets and all the people seized him. In the Hebrew, it literally says they grabbed him and they took him, saying, surely you shall surely die. I mean, they wanted to kill him. So I don't know what he said. Uh, it, it doesn't give us too much into what he said, but I'm sure it was about repentance. I'm sure it was about their lifestyle. I'm sure it was about the sin that was going on in the temple and in the community and so forth. And they didn't like it that they grabbed him and they wanted to kill him. They said, Why have you prophesied in the name of the Lord, saying, This house shall be like Shiloh, and this city shall be desolate without an inhabitants? And all the people were gathered against Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. And it says all of them. They all were against him. How would you like to be in that situation? Not a friendly place to be, huh? Imagine yourself preaching a message like that imagine yourself in your own families we, we all probably have encountered this where you're trying to be a light and a reflection and all you get from them is harassment and innuendos and sarcasm how many of us have endured that we've all endured that you just want to go you know what forget you guys i'm, I'm out of here i don't need this you know i'll go somewhere else and preach that maybe they'll want to receive it it's a hard place to be that everybody was against him. When the prince, princes of Judah heard these things, they came up from the king's house to the house of the Lord and sat down in the entry of the new gate of the Lord's house. And the priests and the prophets spoke to the princes and all the people saying, This man deserves to die, for he has prophesied against this city as you have heard with your ears. So that was the message. Whatever he described it as, judgment was coming upon from their view, on God's city. That's not right. He's talking about God's temple. Talking about God's people. And he's saying judgment? No, this man deserves to die. How dare he say that God's temple will be destroyed? How dare he say that God's people, God loves us. He's, he's watching out for us. We have men prophesying, saying that, no, this isn't true, that things will be fine. Don't worry about it. Continue on with your life. Just like we do today. So listen to what Jeremiah says, verse 12. Then Jeremiah spoke to all the prince of the people, saying, The Lord sent me to prophesy against the house, this house, and against this city, and all the words that you have heard. So his defense basically was, The Lord told me to do it. That's it. The Lord told me to do it. Now, obviously, God gave the word to Jeremiah, and Jeremiah heard it very clearly. As a pastor... When I go through the scriptures, and, and as you know, you've been here long enough now, I believe, you know I just do a running commentary in a sense, right? And we go through a book, we, we pick some verses, and we just run through it, and I just preach it. So in a sense, the Lord told me to do this. He's telling me to preach this. Next week, we'll be in chapter 27. No surprises, you know, we'll be in 27. And what 27 says, I'm going to share with you what it says. And the Lord's told me to just do that. Because as a Calvary chapel, we go... Book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, precept upon precept, and so forth. So the Lord's told us to do that, and that's what we do, and that's our defense. You know, for anyone that says that you know, your preaching isn't uh, very good, you know, or I don't, 
don't like it, and so forth. I was listening to Tony Evans the other day, actually on my way to the, the meeting, meeting to the Greek and the Hebrew meeting, and I was listening to him on, on the way to this meeting, and I, was, I just wanted to listen to how he presented it, not necessarily what he was saying, and, and I was more interested in how he presented it, and Tony Evans got a pretty good sized church. And you know what he was doing? He was just retelling the story. He was in the Old Testament talking about Rahab, the harlot. And he just retold the story. Uh, through the whole 20 minutes that I was listening to it, he says, oh yeah, so there's Jericho. And, I mean, there's Joshua and his men around him. And there's harlot, Rahab. And her name, Ray, was a god. So she worshipped a god, Ra, which was an idol that she worshipped. She was a harlot. And yet God was going to use her. And he was just retelling the story. And I'm going, there's nothing special about how he did that. And, and once in a while, he, he, he'd, he'd say something about her, you know, and how she was willing to accept God, not on what she saw, but what she heard. She heard, like any of the others in Jericho, what God had done for Israel. But what she heard changed her life. She knew that this God was powerful and so she was going to help this God out. And you hear people in the background, you hear all these claps. Yeah! I'm like, well, he didn't say anything profound. It wasn't like a, a great insight. He just repeated what the scripture said. And I'm just like, okay, that's so strange. What's going on here? I mean, isn't that what I do? You know. And yet you always have that opposition. I only share... What the Lord has told me to share, Jer Jeremiah said. I think the question that needs to be asked is, what is being said scripturally? That's the question that we really need to ask ourselves as, as we're sitting there. Someone asked me years ago, you know, if someone comes up, if someone comes up to you and, and, and they just say, you know, uh, I just see this and I, I, I'm just hoping that you won't be offended by it, but, you know, this is what I see, blah, blah, blah. I mean, how do you take that? And I says, well, you take it. Is it scriptural? Is what they said scriptural? Does it apply? And if it doesn't, say thank you. And I'll take this back. I'll pray about it and I'll ask the Lord to help me because I want to please Him. Same with the word when it's being brought forth to us to, to, at the table to eat of. Is it scriptural? Is what He's saying scriptural? And if it is, then I need to apply because it's God's word. Now therefore, Jeremiah says, amend your ways and your doings and obey the voice of the Lord your God. Then the Lord will relent concerning the doom that he has pronounced against you. So uh, again, the hope and the grace and mercy of God. Look, all you got to do is turn. And, and again, God will turn away and he will not judge you. As for me, here I am in your hands. So, I mean, he, I can almost envision them holding him while he's talking. Hey, look, guys, you know, God told me to do this. But you know what? If you just stop what you're doing and, 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 and just repent, God promised that he'll, he'll stop what he's going to do and he won't judge the world. And they still got a hold on him. So here I am and, and you got me in your hands. Do with me as seems good and proper to you. <clears throat> he didn't defend himself, did he? He didn't say, let me go because God is the one that said it, not me. You have no right to hold me to accuse me you have no rights i have rights you know and what you're doing is wrong he just said i'm in your hands go ahead and do whatever you want i'm learning that i think we all should learn that to stop defending ourselves and just let god defend us just trust in god you know you're going to get people that don't like you you get people that don't like what you say and that's just the way it's going to be no matter what uh, <clears throat> I've tried to say things calmly, doesn't work. I tried to say things sternly, doesn't always work. I try to say things not at all, doesn't always work either. And so I just learned to just, you know what, do what you need to do. You need to go and seek the Lord and pray and, you know, hey, I'm going to continue to do what I'm doing. You're not going to stop me. I'm going to be faithful to the Lord. But know, but know for certain that if... You put me to death, and he was expecting to die. You will surely bring innocent blood on yourselves and on this city and on its inhabitants. For truly the Lord has sent me to speak all these words in your hearing. What did Paul say in Hebrews? 
if you are not obedient to those that rule over you, you know, and, and they're not doing it with joy, it's bad for you. Not for the pastor, they said. Right? Paul said that. It's bad for you. Here, Jeremiah says, look, if you do this, blood's on your hands. God's going to take care of you. Verse 16, the leaders in the people see no reason to put him to death. And so he's kind of, uh, he is delivered from them. So the princes and all the people said to the priests and the prophets, this man does not deserve to die for he has spoken to us in the name of the Lord our God. Now, I don't know if they felt guilty. I don't know the, you know what they were thinking uh, while they had him. And he's saying, hey, I'm just saying what God said. And they're saying, hey, he believes that he's preaching what God says, so you know, I don't think he deserves to die. They didn't literally say, you know what, he's preaching what God says, and we need to be obedient, so don't, don't kill him. They didn't say that because they went on to not be obedient. I think they just felt guilty that they were taking someone who has dedicated his life to the Lord, is preaching the message that God has given to them, is a prophet of God, and they just says, no, don't kill him because then his blood will be on us, and we don't want that to happen. Then certain of the elders and of the land rose up and spoke to all the assembly of the people, saying, Micah of Morseth prophesied in the days of Hezekiah, king of Judah, and spoke to all the people in Judah, saying, Thus, Says the Lord of hosts, Zion shall be plowed like a field. Jerusalem shall be a heap of ruins and the mountains of the temple like the bare hills of the forest. So he's giving an example of someone else who also preached. And it says, did Hezekiah king of Judah and all of Judah ever put him to death? Did he not fear the Lord and seek the Lord's favor? And the Lord relented concerning the doom which he had pronounced against them. But we are doing great evil against ourselves. And so they spoke up and they realized, hey, but there's an example during Hezekiah. This man Didn't this man speak up? And he said doom was coming, but they didn't kill him and God relented. God did not do that like he said. So maybe we ought to let him go. And then they give another example. Now, uh, there was also a man who prophesied in the name of the Lord, Ujirah, the son of Shimrath of kirath Jerem who prophesied against the city and against the land according to all the words of Jeremiah. So here's another guy who did the same thing. And when Jehoiakim, the king, verse 21, with all the mighty men and all the prince heard his words, the king sought to put him to death, but when Uriah heard it, he was afraid and fled and went to Egypt. But not Jeremiah. So here's this example. Here's another guy, and he did the same thing, but as soon as the king got a hold of him, To kill him, he ran. He took off. He said, forget this. I think Pastor Gary was sharing about how many pastors are leaving the church. How many churches are shutting down? What, 1,200 a month? They're running. Maybe they can't preach the word. Maybe the body that they're involved in isn't letting them preach the word. I've heard stories of pastors who have who have been a part of denominations. Now, a dom- do- denomination is where the pastor does not have the authority. It's a group of men that have the authority of, over the church and not the pastor. He basically is what we would call a harling. They hire him and he does what he's told. And so they'll they'll direct him. Okay, we want you to teach about this and don't teach about that. And basically they're telling him what to teach. And so he's not really a pastor. He's a harling. He's hired to, to do what they say. And I've heard of those men firing pastors like that. They don't like him. He's not doing what, what we think he should be doing. The church isn't growing the way it should be growing. And so we, he's out of here. We're going to interview some more men and see if, if maybe one of them will, will um, work out in a sense. And so, I mean, you go into a place like that and you're scared. You, and right away you want to leave. You want to get out of there. And so like this guy who felt threatened to death, he wanted to leave. He wanted to run. And a lot of pastors are running because they're getting tired of doing good. When Paul was clear, is don't get weary of doing good. Continue to do good because you don't serve man, you serve God. See, I don't serve you. I serve God. I was talking with another pastor and we were talking kind of about this, though he didn't know I was going through this. 
and he was he was sharing how <clears throat> how his church has fluctuated and he, he really thinks that it is because he teaches the truth and so people come and they go and, and if they stay it's because they want to hear the truth and if they go it's because they don't want to hear the truth and so he sees this fluctuation and he says and i think that's why there's a lot of lo- small churches the bigger churches aren't always teaching the truth they're teaching something else that are drawing the people in they're they're hearing these things uh, whether they're it's the truth or whether it's the opportunity that they have basketball teams and volleyball teams and they have all kinds of things for the kids and you know uh, we we were in a situation years ago where we didn't have a youth ministry we didn't have a youth pastor we didn't have a youth leader we were praying for one we were hoping that that someone would would stand up and say i'll do it so i had to fill in every once in a while or whenever i could but no one stood up and said i'll do it and so there were families that say well we're not going to stay here we can't stay here because we have nothing for our kids here well why don't you stay and start something they don't see that because they want their kids to go there so they can go do something else you know drop their kids off and Friday night dates for them while their kids are, you know, on at church Friday night. That could be. I'm not saying that was everyone's motive. And of course, I had these families, and so I kind of tried to reason with them. I go, look, you're going to devastate the church, and they didn't care. They left anyway, and it impacted the church. I also shared with them that Friday night youth is not a biblical meeting nowhere in scripture does it say youth ought to meet on friday nights nowhere does it say that the women's ministry should be wednesdays and tuesdays the bible says that they gather together on the first day of the week everybody that's it we've come up with all these other ideas that aren't biblical i'm not saying they're wrong i mean i think they're great but when we begin to accuse the church of not meeting the needs of the people and say wait a minute it's not even biblical you're wrong completely wrong and so they leave they run because they're not seeing what they want to see within the church the church isn't about what we see in the church the church is about how we help the church how we serve the church right if we would just learn this one scripture and i'm speaking to myself too if we just learn this one scripture where jesus said i did not come to be served but to serve and to be a ransom for many or to die is what he was saying to die for people if we would learn that that i'm not in church to be served i'm in church to serve and so he gathered his disciples together and he said, give me your feet, I'm going to wash them. And they're like, why are you doing this? As an example to you, so that you go and do the same. So he set the example for us. <clears throat> but our culture demands that we get something. You know, that we get something. Now this isn't in the scripture, but I mentioned it last week and Roman mentioned it this morning. You know, just like our giving. Unless we see some return, we're not going to give. That's unbiblical. And see, and that's the, the whole attitude of not being a servant. It's an attitude of what am I getting for my giving? What am I getting for participating here? What am I getting for coming on Sunday mornings? You know, Not what am I giving? What am I giving? <clears throat> this man ran... And when Jehoiakim the king and the mighty men and all the prince heard his words, the king sought to put him to death, he fled. He was afraid and he ran and fled to Egypt. Then Jehoiakim, verse 22, the king sent men to Egypt, Alnathan the son of Akbor and other men who went with him to Egypt and they brought Uriah from Egypt and brought him to Jehoiakim the king who killed him with the sword and cast his dead body into the graves of the common people. So that was his reward for being fearful. Wow, that's a warning to me. Not to diminish God's word, but to preach it all. Now, for us common people that are out there, 
is that we need to share God's word with people, with our neighbors and our friends. You know, we've been trying to reach our neighbor across the street. We've invited them to church and they came one time. And, and it was one of those times where I happened to be preaching about being rich and how being rich uh, means that you should be helping the church because God has given you the responsibility and the gift to make money. And so I don't know if that was the greatest time to invite them for the first you know, Sunday. They haven't been back since, but we're, we're really close. We talk to each other. He's, he's, a, he's a, a landscaper, so he's helped me with, with stuff here. You know? And the Lord keeps nudging at me to invite him again, invite him again. And so I'm looking for that opportunity uh, to invite him again. And, and we need to be open to that. Not to, not to build this church, but to build the body of Christ. And we need to understand that. Uh, to build the kingdom, that should be our heart wherever we go is how we can reflect Christ and share. Again, you're going to share truth and so there will be difficulties with that. People will reject it. People will not like it. I think there is a point in time as Jesus sent the disciples out and he says, you go door to door and when you come to a house, you knock on the door. If they receive you, go in and they'll feed you, they'll clothe you, you know, they'll provide for your needs but if they reject you what did he say do just stomp your feet and be done with them go to the next place uh jesus said it's like throwing pearls to swine what is swine going to do with pearls so what are the ungodly going to do with the truth the gospel of grace and love and there is a time there is a time where, where you're sharing with your loved ones, your family, and they're just mocking and laughing and taking every opportunity. And so, you know what? You know what? Pearls before swines. I don't need this anymore. i got to move on because they're not going to receive it from me. Maybe someone else needs to come along and, and hopefully minister to them. So that's understandable. You tried, and you tried for years, and it's time to move on and, and try somewhere else. In a sense, you throw your, your pole somewhere else, right? When you're fishing. If you're a fisherman, and as a fisherman, you know that, that you don't always just fish in the same hole. Unless you're catching, <laughs> then you just keep it there and you keep reeling them in. But if you're not catching, usually you move down a little bit, then you move down some more. Next thing you know, you find yourself, how did I get here? Boy, I was way over there. Well, you weren't catching anything over there. So now you're over here and you're now catching. And that's what we're doing with the gospel. We're looking for opportunities where the Spirit is moving in people's hearts. And He's not moving here. Hasn't moved in a while, so it's time to move on. So Jeremiah says in verse 24, Nevertheless, the hand of Ahiakim, the son of Shapnah, was with Jeremiah, so that they should not give him into the hands of the people to put him to death. So God spared his life. God is our defender. God is the one that protects us. God is the one that will be faithful because we are faithful to share the whole truth and not diminish it whatsoever. And so really, Jeremiah is an example of just be faithful. Just be faithful with what God has given you to share it with others. And God will do his part. The results are his, right? Not ours. Don't worry about the results. That's God's job. We just be faithful with what he's given us.